Now, finally, it's time to build the torso rig. I'm actually going to cover this in two videos, because the final solution is going to be somewhat complex. In this first video, we're going to figure out how we want the torso to behave, and we're going to figure out half of the rigging for it. In the second video, we're going to figure out the other half of the rigging for it. So let's get started. First things first. Why am I calling this a torso rig? Why not a spine rig? Well, this is kind of a personal preference of mine. Sometimes I do call it a spine rig, but usually I try to call it a torso rig, and here's why. Torso rigs include the hips, and they do not include the neck. A lot of spine rigs out there treat the hips as if they're a separate part of the character, but anatomically, the hips, spine, ribcage, and neck are all kind of intertwined, skeletally speaking. And as an animator, I found that I usually think of the hips, ribcage, and the part of the spine that's between them as a single unit. When you rotate either your hips or your ribcage, the spine actually has to bend to accommodate that. And this unit of parts is most accurately called the torso, I think, anyway. As always, the simplest way we could rig this is just to create a simple FK bone chain. The number of bones you should use for this is somewhat debatable, but at least the minimum number you should use is three. One for the pelvis, one for the rib cage, and one for the spine connecting them. For some rigs, that's enough, but it really depends on the character. For most humanoid characters, the spine section between the rib cage and pelvis is actually pretty short, and that's where most of the bending happens. But in other animals, that spine section can be quite long, so you'll want more bones to approximate the curve of the spine better. I found that for humanoid characters, four bones is usually a good choice. One for the pelvis, one for the spine, and two for the rib cage. Why two for the rib cage? Well, because it's large, and it actually has some flexibility to it. It's not nearly as flexible as the connecting spine, but it does have a little flexibility, and it's good to allow for that. Anyway, given that we have these four bones, is this really a good rig? Well, no. In fact, no, not at all, even for simple rigs. And that is yet again because of our arch nemesis, counter animation. In this case, we have at least two things that the animator would have to counter animate. The first is that the pelvis and rib cage rotate independently a lot. And yet, in our FK chain here, the rib cage bones will clearly be following the pelvis since they are its children, or, well, grandchildren anyway. So if the animator wants to rotate the pelvis, but have the rib cage remain stationary, they need to counter animate. But that's not the only thing. Right now, the pivot point of the pelvis is pretty bad. These bones will be placed in the character like this, so right now, the pelvis is rotating from the crotch. Which, while absolutely hilarious, isn't really useful. When characters walk, their hips typically swing from higher up on the body, closer to the waist. And right now, that would require some pretty horrific counter animation to accomplish. Curse you, counter animation! Curse you! So how can we remedy these issues? Well, there is one solution that is quite simple, and it's the solution that I used for Big Buck Bunny. If we unparent the spine from the pelvis, and then flip the pelvis bone with Alt-F. Then we can just treat the pelvis as a socket bone, and constrain the spine to it with a copy location constraint. Now we can swing the hips from approximately the waist, and the upper body doesn't go with it. Yay! This solution is fine for a lot of rigs. If you're in a rush to rig a character, and all the character is going to do is walk around, and maybe sit down occasionally, then this really isn't too bad to animate with. I certainly don't recall ever getting too frustrated animating with it on Big Buck Bunny. However, we can make it even better. And we can make it better by observing that right now, the animator has to manage all four of these bones separately. It would be nice if we could simplify things and make this more like Mr. Hot Dog's body rig, where the animator only has to control the top and bottom, and everything in the middle bends appropriately to accommodate that. And at this point, I don't even need to introduce anything new to show you how to do that. If you go back to the head and neck rig video, I explain everything you need to know. All we have to do is give each of the bones in this chain an intermediate parent, just like the head and neck rig. We can then use those parents to create a Mr. Hot Dog style rig for the torso. So let's add the intermediate parents. The only confusing bit here is that the parent of the pelvis is going to be in the same place as the parent for the spine. 
So let's move the hips down in edit mode for now until we get everything set up. Now add the parent bones. And make sure they're aligned properly, of course. Now set up the parent-child hierarchy. And now we can create the two control bones, one for the bottom and one for the top. And now we can add the constraints, just like on Mr. Hot Dog and the head and neck rig. And let's rotate the upper control and adjust the constraint influences to create a nice bend. Finally, let's move the pelvis bone back in edit mode. Now the animator doesn't have to manage anything other than these two controls. Cool. And of course, like with Mr. Hot Dog, we can move the controls to the pivot point and set up the various constraints to make the torso and upper control follow the bottom control. But we're not going to bother here since we already know how to do that. Also, we can still improve this even more. There's still something deficient in this rig, which is that real people can shift their chest and hips from side to side and front to back. If you've ever watched belly dancers do isolation exercises, you'll know what I mean. And if you haven't, then go to YouTube right now. Most people can't do this in isolation, like belly dancers can, of course, but it still happens all the time in combination with other motions, and it is very important for achieving certain poses. In fact, I made a big boo-boo on the Sintel rigs and didn't allow for this, so you can blame me for some of the animation quality issues. <laughs> but I've learned my lesson now, and I'm passing it on to you. Some of you may have already caught on that the animator can still directly manipulate the torso bones here. So, to be honest, you can stop here if you want. However, we're going to need a separate control for this when we get to the second video. Moreover, if you have additional spine bones, you don't necessarily want the animator to have to manage all of them. So, let's create a separate control for the middle of the torso. Just duplicate one of the existing controls to create it. And let's move the pelvis down again for clarity. Let's remove the constraints from the middle two parents. Now let's add constraints to the lower parent from the lower and middle controls. And add constraints to the upper parent from the upper and middle controls. Now rotate the upper and middle controls and start adjusting the influences. Since we only have one spine bone, it's actually nice for the middle control to completely control it, so let's actually just remove the constraint of the lower control. And rib cage bending is pretty subtle. So this is cool. We can control the middle of the spine now, but we've kind of taken a step backwards as far as ease of use goes. It would be nice if this was more just a control that the animator can adjust when they need, rather than a control that they constantly have to manage. So let's give the middle control a parent and constrain that parent to the upper and lower controls. That way it will automatically rotate with the upper and lower controls, but the animator can still adjust and animate on top of that as well when needed.
And if you want to get really fancy, you could totally make this a switchable parent kind of deal. But I'll leave that as an exercise for you. It could definitely come in handy, reducing counter animation in some cases. So we've got a pretty nifty spine rig here. And for most characters, this would be more than enough. But remember that our character needs to be able to do acrobatics. And that means, for example, that if he's swinging on a trapeze by his hands, or if he's doing a handstand or something like that, then having the pivot point of the torso be at the hips is really unhelpful. We would much prefer the pivot point to be in the upper body in those cases. So ideally, we would like to modify the torso rig so that the animator can move the pivot point. Intuitively, we would like to make it so the animator can move the pivot point while the torso stays stationary. But it turns out that in addition to being really, really hard to rig, it's not really what the animator wants, even if they think they do. Instead, it's better to move the torso while the pivot point remains stationary. To understand why, let's consider just a single bone. Let's pretend that we have a pivot point that we can slide anywhere along this bone. So for example, we can rotate it either from its head or from its tail. This seems all well and good, but if we do a bunch of subsequent rotations, now it's basically walking across the screen. There is an implicit translation in this. And of course, that's realistic and to be expected, but there are two things that are bad about this. The first is that in a real rig, this translation would be entirely due to rotations and sliding the pivot point. The actual translation values of the rig wouldn't be changing, and that's kind of weird and not very nice for the animator. The second is that this creates a dependency between earlier parts of the animation and later parts of the animation. Different rotation and pivot sequences earlier in the animation result in different locations later in the animation. So that means, for example, that if the animator goes back and tweaks an earlier part of the animation, it could potentially screw up everything that comes after it. And that's extremely, extremely bad. So instead, we're going to have the torso shift and have the pivot point stay put. This avoids both of those problems, but it still allows for the functionality we want. So let's move on now to the next video to figure out how to set that up.